Thank you for that um, overly kind introduction, Chad. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the CDC opiate prescribing guidelines. Um, uh, and uh, by way of my acknowledgments, um, hopefully get into my involvement with them a little bit as background. So I'm a faculty member in the Department of Psychiatry. I also am a researcher with the VA. Um, and I am a member of the uh, Injury Center here at the University of Michigan. But how some of the analysis I'll talk about today came about, as well as my involvement with the guidelines, is I've had an intergovernmental personnel agreement with the CDC for a number of years. So they paid some of my salary to work on evaluating the guidelines. So um, I think that's important for understanding context of uh, disclosure for this. I collaborated with people at the CDC for this evaluation of their guidelines, and um, we had intellectual feedback through their clearance process. So um, this is certainly not a completely arm's length evaluation. I have some other funding that um, is unrelated. So uh, in around 2015, so it takes a little while to make a guideline, the CDC started to think about what they could do to address opiate prescribing to try and curb the opiate epidemic and decided that they would come together with a clinical practice guideline. There's some evidence that clinical guidelines can change prescriber behavior, although it's not a robust amount of evidence. Um, but so they went through a process of multiple stakeholder meetings, multiple drafts, got feedback, and released this guideline for prescribing for opiates for chronic pain, that's its full technical name, which they prefer that is, is used, in March 2016. This was national in scope, although um, primarily focused on primary care context, and it was voluntary. There was no real enforcement of it. They did have a fairly coordinated implementation strategy. I saw you, you get, shot me a look, because there has been um, some things like CMS potentially uh, considered um, not reimbursing for uh, services that were not supported by some of these guidelines. But in general, it was not something that came with any teeth to force peop uh, providers to be consistent with the guidelines. So I'm going to talk about a particular paper, which was had the research question is, was the time of the CDC guideline release associated with changes in opiate prescribing behavior that correlated with the specific recommendations? So let me talk about what those recommendations are for a minute. So this is from the website for the CDC guideline. Um, there's both a, a long detailed version, but there's uh, kind of a, a bullet points version of what the guideline is too. And for, I looked over what your schedule is today. I think what I'm gonna talk about here, in terms of what the guideline actually says to do, is not gonna be controversial at all. These are incredibly um, uh, borderline self-evident things to do in our order to do reasonably good um, management of opiates, especially in the primary care context. Uh, but nonetheless, they've become quite controversial. So let's talk about what they are. The first couple recommendations have to do with determining when to initiate or continue opiates for chronic pain. So the first one is to try to use non-opiate medications, non-opiate, oh, sorry, um, non-pharmacological treatments before you use opiates to treat them as a, a last resort. And actually, um, there's some degree to which I take issue with this in that it suggests that opiates are the most effective but just have most, the most risks, so you save them for later, but really there are probably certain types of pain for which they are less effective than some of the alternatives, so that's um, actually maybe a little bit of a problem with this specific guideline. The second is to establish treatment goals and to decide how and when to discontinue. Um, I think the, the treatment goals part should hopefully be fairly non-controversial. Um, I think the deciding when you would discontinue is probably a, a little bit more of a complicated conversation to have with patients. And then the third is to discuss risks and benefits. Um, so let me pause for a second there. Anybody have any, feel any of this should be controversial? Any questions? No? We're good? Okay. Uh, section two, these are some of the specific decisions about what treatment would look like. So the first is to prescribe immediate release opiates instead of extended release long acting opiates when starting. Um, so uh, how many, sorry, raise the hands, how many people in the room are prescribers? So just a couple. So the immediate release are the short acting, every four hour medications. Extended release are the, the Oxycontins and some of the others that are more eight to 12 hours. Uh, long acting, I think typically is only used for methadone as a, a term. So this feels somewhat self-evident that you probably shouldn't put someone on a um, really powerful 
opiate is the first one you treat with, but this recommendation was based on a study that was done in the VA by Matt Miller at Harvard, uh, where they found that patients who started, who, it, who were opiate naive and then started with the long acting or immediate, sorry, extended release opiate had a higher risk of overdose than who were on immediate release. Um, so it's a, but it was a, a rare practice, but nonetheless it ended up in the guidelines because of that one paper. The next was to use the lowest effective dosage. So that was the, the wording of it. And then um, I did some analysis prior to the guidelines so around 2015 with colleagues at the VA where we looked at um, uh, prescribed opiate dosage and risk of overdose and um, found that there was no real clear threshold, but it did seem that the, the um, number of cases relative to number of controls, we did this in a nested case control study, uh, became disproportionate, <coughs> excuse me, after about 50 morphine equivalent milligrams and even more so after 90. So the prior studies had looked at like 100, 120 kind of thresholds, but we did some more nuanced analyses because all of those, including my own study that was before that, just kind of a priority picked a number. It wasn't really based on treating it as a more continuous variable. So based on that analysis, these were the numbers that they put in the guideline. Um, we discussed the idea of this being like a yellow light, red light kind of threshold, but I think they backed off of that, but that's essentially the concept. The next uh, was to use the fewest days needed for acute pain and said that that should typically be three or fewer days, but um, except in very rare cases, be less than seven days. I think back to the enforcement question, there have been a number of states, I think including Michigan, that have uh, that have put some enforcement behind this in the year since in terms of making it so that you are not supposed to, I, um, Chad or Dan, do you know what the actual enforcement is of that is for not prescribing more than seven days in Michigan? Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. <laughs> What's a small state? <laughs> it might actually be less than proportional to our population difference. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that is recommendation number six. Uh, and then the seven is one that um, the first part of it should be not controversial of all, which is to evaluate the benefits of harms in the first one to four weeks. So meaning meet with the patient and evaluate how they're doing and then continue to do that at least every three months. That I think should seem like a fairly low threshold of checking in with a patient. I think the second part of this is where it got a little bit more controversial, which is to consider tapering if the potential risk for harms is outweighing the benefits, which of course is hard to define when you're talking about a risk of something rather than um, say, you know, overtly having side effects with no redu reduction in pain, I think that would be somewhat obvious. Uh, but <clears throat> I think this one in particular has resulted in, um, combined with the dosage one, has resulted in thinking that, um, that tapering should be fairly routine. Number eight, uh, have people already talked today about naloxone? No? Okay, so naloxone uh, is a um, fast-acting drug that can reverse an opiate overdose. So this is what EMS uses if they arrive at the scene of an overdose. And there's a lot of work to have lay pr people in the community um, be able to have access to naloxone. There's a standing order in Michigan where someone can go to a pharmacy and ask for it without needing to have a prescription. Um, and there are other programs that give it out. Uh, so the recommendation number eight is to co-prescribe naloxone um, when indicated. So for patients with a substance use disorder <clears throat> with a prior overdose history, which of course is the strongest predictor of future overdose, uh, those who are on higher dosage and those who have concurrent benzodiazepine use. This one is actually interesting. It was not in um, the initial guidelines uh, and there was some controversy and not everybody on the on the the expert panel that I was a part of felt like this there was enough evidence based to strongly recommend recommend this because it does have cost. Naloxone used to be pretty cheap; it really only cost about two dollars a dose to produce. But um, uh, but the nasal spray version that the FDA approved, I think, is something more like forty dollars a dose. There's an auto ejector that's something like eight hundred dollars a dose. Uh, so this one was a little bit more controversial within our panel, but um, but it has been less so after 
The next one is to review the prescription drug monitoring program every three months, so that's checking maps, and I think, in fact, the Michigan's passed laws that are at a higher frequency than this since then. The next is to do a urine drug screen every year. This one, again, sounds like it might be um, not controversial at all, but there are costs to doing this, and some of those costs are often borne by the patient, so it's a little bit more uh, nuanced, and there's not necessarily a fantastic evidence base that this improves the, um, the quality of risk management. Uh, number 11 is to avoid concurrent benzodiazepine prescribing. So um, uh, if patients are on opiates and benzos to attempt to taper one or the other, I think the guideline recommended to taper the opiate first or attempt to taper an opiate before you would attempt the benzo. Um, I think others might feel differently about that. And then number 12 is to offer or arrange medications for opioid use disorders if needed. So uh, I defer to all of Allison's talk on this one and all the complications of what implementing this looks like in practice, right? But I think um, my opinion would be that this, this recommendation should mean that, uh, that providers should take on the responsibility of um, becoming wavered themselves in order to be able to provide treatment or ensuring that their practice has access. So. Any questions on the rest of the guideline here, or any thoughts, anything you think I underplayed how difficult it would be to, to do? Yeah, so that, um, I think the way I would interpret this and what I would, uh, I would believe too, and I'd be curious what, if my colleagues have differing thoughts, is that the, the significant other, anyone who lives with them, would be the perfect person to get it if someone fits one of these categories where they're high risk for overdose. So I think routinely doing it for everyone just because they're on opiate, it, I'm not sure would be a cost effective um, policy. Uh, but for people who meet this criteria, uh, if you're having an overdose, you're not going to be able to administer it to yourself. So certainly having someone who's likely to be the most likely witness for that person to have one would be ideal to have involved in that appointment and learn how to use it. It's not complicated to, 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 to use, and there's videos online that people can figure out how to use it from. Um, it's you know probably a three-minute training, but ideally they're in the doctor's office learning. Do you guys have any differing opinions on that? Anything else? OK. So as I alluded to, the while those sound pretty straightforward, the guidelines ended up being considerably more controversial than I think the CDC an anticipated. <clears throat> um, anybody have any, like, have you heard anything about this? Any guesses as to why that is? <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, I'm sorry, but I was involved in the HHS. The same thing is they, they roll out the patients on, that they say are on really high doses of opioids that are doing really well. Um, again, I've never seen one of those people. That's why I refer to them as unicorns. Um, but they overly have a driven policy in this regard. Mm -hmm. that those, those anecdotes of overly driven policy. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you mean by weaponization? Well, I mean, I think that where people were looking for something mm -hmm. to use to come down hard upon this group of users, if mm -hmm. you will, and in some states or whatever, they didn't really care about the consequences of, mm -hmm. of the laws that were passed or the policies that were put forth, or think them through. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, uh, so I, I would be curious, uh, so uh, Michael Barnett, who co-presented with us at the, um, has some data that the number of tapers actually did not increase after the CDC guidelines. So the controversy is this idea that people took the guideline and said, oh, this means patients can't be on high doses anymore, and for our current existing patients, you know, let's set it that they all have to be tapered. And so clinics set a policy that we no longer prescribe above this certain limit, um, or payers said we're not gonna pay for it above a certain limit, so it essentially enforcing a hard stop on it, which the way the guideline was written was meant to be don't um, increase uh, 
patients who are currently starting opiates above those thresholds. So it wasn't meant to apply to existing patients, uh, except for that caveat around the considering tapering if the, the um, harms outweigh the benefits. Uh, so I think um, the, yes, that like routine application to everybody already on high doses and creating policies. But I've wondered if, um, if actually historically a number of those patients in the counterfactual of no guideline, those patients would have been tapered anyway, that, that often they were, they were people with challenging relationships with their providers um, or who were getting unsafe regimens and the guideline became an easy thing to blame for that decision rather than having a more effective patient provider conversation about it since the number of tapers haven't actually gone up. Um, but it could be that in, in certain instances it has gone up and people who would not have been affected before are. So a couple months ago in April, two months ago, the authors of the CDC guidelines, so Deborah Dow and Tamara Hegerich are CDC employees and um, uh, Roger Chow does the systematic review that was the evidence base for the guideline, um, published a perspective in New England Journal saying, hold up everybody, you're misinterpreting the guideline, you're taking it too far, um, and let's pause and be more cautious with this, which I think was a, um, uh, a good thing to do. So the, the first part here in particular describes the concern about the um, over interpretation around these dosage thresholds being hard stops and that there have been policies that have gone too far in indiscriminately applying it to everyone. They also mentioned in this article, and I'm not sure I've, I've heard of this as much, I'm curious if others have, of people um, interpreting the same dosage threshold to be applicable to using methadone or buprenorphine for opiate use disorders as well, um, when really it was clearly meant in the context of opiate analgesics. Um, so, uh, so they said, please stop, don't do that. However, the second paragraph I thought was interesting and um, alludes to things that uh, Dr. Claw has mentioned many times and you alluded to there as well, which is that we don't actually know that patients were benefiting from these high dosages. So they backed off a little bit in, in um, saying that, you know, I think we do still need to think about uh, um, uh, and study whether tapering is, is beneficial. Um, uh, for in terms of the fact that some patients taper and have no increase in their pain and um, and maybe reducing some of the risks as well. So uh, I don't think it necessarily answered things any more than where it was before, but I think they, the CDC is now advocating for not taking too extreme of an interpretation <laughs> of the guideline. So I'll talk through some analyses we did to evaluate the guideline a little bit. Um, uh, in a particular paper that was with, um, so Gary Guy and Jan Losby are colleagues who are at the CDC in the uh, injury um, prevention uh, branch of it. This was a uh, paper where the CDC purchased Equivia data. This used to be called IMS, but this is essentially pharmacy records that get rolled up from fills nationally. They cover about 90% of US pharmacies. And then the numbers that I'll show are based on their estimates of extrapolating from that 90% to the entire country. We looked at the period of 2002 to 2007, sorry, 2012 to 2017, because we know that opiate prescribing started to decline around 2012. So in terms of doing regression analyses, that gave us a, um, uh, a steady one direction to work with in our regression modeling. Um, and there's a couple things that, it, uh, that this data doesn't include. And then we also used UN's, um, <coughs> excuse me, census data for some of the denominators here. I'm gonna focus on the outcomes that I highlighted in blue, because there were a number of things we looked at here to operationalize different specific guidelines, but um, some of them were semi-redundant with each other. So I'm just gonna show the ones that cover the overall opiate prescribing rate, which of course was not a specific um, recommendation to reduce, but one would anticipate that it might go down in the context of the guideline. The high dosage prescribing, the days supplied because of that acute pain recommendation, the, um, excuse me, concurrent benzodiazepine fills, and then that kind of odd one about initiating on an extended release long acting that was rare to begin with. 
we used an interrupted time series analysis approach for this. So this is a way of measuring population level interventions when there is no control group. So of course, we would have loved to have something to compare to here, but because the scope of the guideline was the entire US, um, there was no way to compare the effect of the guideline to some area that was not affected by the guideline using a single um, type of data. What a interruptive time series analysis can do is it gives you the results for both a one-time change, that's what's called the intercept there, and the changes in trajectory slope. So if you look at this picture, you can see that potentially you would pick up on both a drop that happens at the point of a intervention being implemented, and then also a change in the rate of change over time, a change in a change. So I'm gonna hop through our results. So in terms of overall prescribing, as I alluded to, it was already going down in 2012. Um, and when the guideline was released, which is that dotted uh, vertical line there in March 2016, that rate of decline significantly sped up. So it's subtle, but you can probably visually see that, that um, there's a, a bit of a greater rate of decline. And there was no drop at that March 2016 time point. So no intercept, just a slope decrease. Similar results for high dosage opiate prescribing. So these, um, because it wasn't a patient level analysis, we just were able to look at where a fill for an individual prescription totaled up to above 90 morphine equivalent milligrams per day. So that's when you take the uh, total amount divided by the day supply, it was more than 90, um, which isn't quite what the guideline was getting at, but nonetheless, uh, is a piece of it. So that was also already declining prior to the guideline release, and then the rate of decline sped up. And this actually looks like a little bit of a sharper effect. There also was a um, effect for a one-time change here at the March time point, but it's unclear that it was really meaningful versus just kind of an artifact of a large sample, because you can see that there's not a real obvious change there. And in fact, the sign of the change was positive, so it would indicate that prescribing actually went up in March and then decreased at a faster rate. So I have a feeling it's just a artifact of the regression methods, not really meaningful. Surprisingly, there was um, uh, a change in the effect on the number of days supply, but in the opposite direction than expected. Um, so the, uh, the number with more than seven, sorry, with less than seven days to su supply was actually decreasing prior. So um, more and more prescriptions were actually written for a larger amount rather than a smaller amount prior. And then that rate of decrease leveled off and became um, uh, stopped declining essentially afterwards. So what we think was happening here actually was that the, um, the number of patients who were getting opiates for acute pain was probably declining over time and what remained in the total population of people getting opiates was more people getting it for chronic pain. So the number of 30 day supply seems as a proportion of all prescriptions is going up while the number that are these small short prescriptions is going down because of the decrease in acute prescribing. Did I explain that well enough? I see some nods. Okay. We looked again at the overlapping benzodiazepines and opiates and this is quite a subtle effect and we, we could look at a, only a smaller time frame because of the type of data Equivia would share for this, but um, the again, the decline in this metric of having overlapping opium benzodiazepine um, for a patient within a given month, uh, so getting more than one of those in the same month, started declining faster after the, the guideline was released and in a significant way. Fairly subtle effect though, this is not a, a dramatic uh, impact at all, I think we can all agree. And then the last one was that kind of um, uh, somewhat unique one of the initiating with an extended release long acting opiate as opposed to an immediate le release opiate. And this we found no significant effect on the slope, but you can see from the percent that this was a uh, fairly rare practice to begin with, less than 2% of all opiate naive people who initiate on an opiate <clears throat> initiate with a um, an ERLA opiate, as it is sometimes called. So a last one that I didn't mention in our methods, but we looked at the, since we had the benzodiazepine de data anyway, we looked at um, the, uh, and I'm sorry, the first label there is wrong, got carried over, but we looked at the 
uh, the number of people who, um, uh, so the first, the top line there was the same as the very first slide, which is the uh, rate of opiate uh, opiate Opiates prescribed per 100 people in the population. The line below it is the rate of benzodiazepines prescribed per 100 people in the population. So this is the overall prescribing rate. The label there is wrong. You can see that both of these things were declining, um, but the rate of decline, it's subtle here. It's not something that jumps out at you looking at it visually, but this was, there was a significant interaction here where the rate of decline was faster for opiates than for benzodiazepines. So potentially there was somewhat of a specific effect of the guideline on opiates affecting opiates as opposed to affecting prescribing generally or for secular trends and what was happening with being more cautious around prescribing generally. In terms of conclusions, um, the uh, opiate prescribing is declining overall. So I think there's some interesting things to think about in this um, uh, pain short course more broadly and thinking about being cautious with opiate prescribing. Overdoses are going up and continuing to go up a lot more and it's driven by uh, illicit opiate prescribing. Um, so uh, obviously being cautious about opiate prescribing is important and the opiate analgesic overdoses specifically appear to have leveled off or even potentially decreased in some areas in response to more cautious prescribing. But whether that is um, enough of a solution for the opiate ep epidemic generally, uh, it clearly the answer is no. Um, and whether the guideline could potentially be worsening the problem because people uh, who were on opiates are transitioning to heroin is a um, question we're trying to test now to, to understand better. So, uh, so this in the broader research context, we were also interested in what is the effect of guidelines. Should the CDC do a guideline again? Is this a good use of their time? Because they put a lot of time and energy into it. Um, it does appear to have some effect on prescriber behavior, even when it's national in scope and not very narrowly focused, and even when there's no enforcement although I think um, whether that is a entirely good effect could certainly continue to be debated. Uh, in terms of limitations, I mentioned there was no control group and they did a number of different implementation things. It's unclear what of those were effective. And I think that will be important to understand better. So um, with that, uh, there are a lot of things that were in the guideline that we were not able to evaluate in this particular data and I'm very interested in whether people had access to opiate use disorder treatment if, um, if the higher level of risk monitoring that the guideline recommended had any impact on identifying people with opiate use disorders, whether or not they got access to treatment. I think it's a particularly important outcome that was not answered here. I mentioned the concern about the transition of people to heroin or to other legal opiate use if they lost access to opiates. We're also very interested in whether um, uh, there's certainly anecdotal reports of people becoming more suicidal after losing access to their opiates. Of course, pain and poorly managed pain and all of these things also are known to have a association with risk of suicide, but whether that crisis point of um, uh, that leads to someone losing access to their opiates may add fuel to that is something that's, I think, important to look at and we're starting to look at now. Um, and I'm curious, any thoughts, questions? It's the end of my, my thoughts. Mm -hmm.